And now we're going to calculate PE ratio. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the market cap. If we take 100 million shares, multiply them by $20 a share, we get a $2 billion market cap. And then we can calculate the PE ratio to price to book and the price to cash flow to equity. Now let's calculate the PE multiple. We're going to take the market capitalization and divide it by the total net earnings. The market cap is 2 billion, the net earnings is 100 million, so the PE ratio is 20 times. We could also calculate it by taking the price per share, which is $20, and the earnings per share, which is $1, and dividing those, and then we get 20 times as well. It's important to note that the PE multiple is driven by several things. The first is how quickly the company's earnings are growing. You'll be willing to pay a lot more for a company that has a higher growth in its earnings than a company that has low growth or declining earnings. So you'll see rapidly growing companies with very high PE ratios. The amount of risk in the company is also a factor. If a company is very high risk, it's going to trade at a discount. If a company is lower risk, it's going to trade at a premium. And finally, the actual cash flow generation of the business. Net earnings are not always equivalent to cash flow, so a company that has lower net earnings in a period of time but has generally significant cash flow may generate a high P-E ratio because of the value that's been captured in the cash flow. Let's also look at normalization of earnings. Earnings includes a lot of so-called noise in the financial statements and things that need to be adjusted for. The first thing is non-recurring items. If there's a one-time gain or a loss, that should be backed out of the earnings since it's not expected to happen every time. If the company is using a type of depreciation method that significantly over or understates the expense, then that could be another type of adjustment to make. If there was a profit or loss on a sale of an asset, for example, a piece of property, that would also be adjusted out. And finally, if there were any asset impairments or write-downs, those would also be backed out as they are one-time expenses that are non-cash and therefore normalized out of earnings. Let's outline a few challenges with the P.E. ratio. The first thing is it cannot cope with a company that has negative earnings. You'll never see a negative P.E. ratio. If the company has negative earnings, you simply see an N.A. or N.E.G. dot, which is short for negative, as the ratio. Earnings can be manipulated as all sorts of accounting items impact that number, whereas cash flow is not quite as easy to manipulate, although in a short term it can be. Earnings can be volatile. Since they're so low in the income statement, they include all of the items, and they can move around quite a bit. So that volatility makes it hard to look at P.E. ratio on a quarterly basis, for example. Finally, for cyclical industries like mining and other extraction businesses, there's a peak and trough of P.E. ratios that range from high to low. And as the cycle moves around, these P.E. ratios may be misleading. They may indicate overvaluation when it's not the case, or they may signal a false buying signal with a very low P.E. value. It's important then to look at a more normalized approach when valuing a company than simply the P.E. ratio. The P.E. ratio is very effective for mature, stable businesses that have steady earnings.